morning, everyone, and welcome to the Climate and Energy College. My name is uh, Nick Parry. Today we have a very uh, special guest, uh, all the way from the University of Hamburg, Felix uh, Shenwit. But, but before we uh, proceed, I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge the traditional owners of the, the land, the Wurundjeri people, people, acknowledge their elders, past, present, and, and aging. So, yeah, uh, very interesting topic. I think I am somewhat biased. I recently completed my own PhD in uh, EU renewable energy policy. Uh, of course, working at the Australian German, German Climate Energy College, which uh, do think that, that EU policy is an important area and, and something of a neglected area of study here in Australia. Australia. So, we're very fortunate to have uh, Felix with us today. Uh, the EU is often at the, at the leading end of uh, climate and energy policy. Uh, and so it's always very interesting to see uh, the uh, EU perspectives and, 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 and get a sense of where policy might be heading uh, in most other countries in 10 years' time, perhaps in, in Australia in 50 years' time, uh, the, the, the way we tend to go. So it's interesting uh, because of the EU perspective, but also because we're talking about carbon dioxide removal. Um, the, it's impossible, I think, to, to uh, reach the 1.5 target, probably, probably even the 2 degree target without uh, negative emissions. Uh, which are going to be uh, very, very important, uh, particularly in the, in the second half of the century. So, so we govern um, uh, carbon dioxide is going to be very, very, very important, uh, as, as it's not even it's on our radar, but certainly it's something that's uh, that's staying to be discussed, discussed in the EU. Uh, currently, you've got a, you've got a, um, a very significant uh, climate pack package uh, for 2050 under negotiation, and in this, uh, as I understand, is, 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 is getting into that. So as I said, Felix is from, from uh, University of Hamburg, which is one of our partner institutions. He is a, a PhD candidate there, uh, working on this uh, very, very, uh, this very, very topic. Uh, he had worked previously uh, at the uh, German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin, and he studied uh, political science and uh, public uh, policy. So a big welcome um, uh, to Felix, and, and I look forward to interesting discussion. <laughs> very much does this work can you hear me or yeah okay so thank you very much very much for the kind introduction also more generally thank you very much very much for hosting me here here uh, i'm really having a, having a great time here in melbourne here at the college and looking forward, forward to four more weeks and I, I already learned a lot i think there is a lot to uh, learn about also in australia european cooperation and stuff like that not only carbon dioxide removal uh, also climate policy more generally and maybe maybe we have to touch uh, on that uh, in a second. So what I'm going to talk about is, um, as we said, uh, carbon dioxide removal governance in, in the European Union. I will talk a, talk a bit about this is a relevant topic, but also how, how it is uh, addressed right, right now. And uh, my argument will be that there are different speeds of acknowledging the need, the fact that we will need carbon dioxide removal in order, in order, in order uh, to reach net zero and, and to need a net negative emission, emission in the second, second half of the century. Uh, this is of, of course, there is a disclaimer. This is one progress. I'm currently sort of writing this, this and that's up for a conference. conference. So really looking forward, forward to your comments, to your ideas, ideas and discussing this, this stuff later. It's a broad overview of what is going on in the EU. I will take some shortcuts. If you disagree or if you have questions on more details, I'm very happy to, to discuss that later. What I'm going to do, I'm, I'm, I will talk about why are we talking about carbon dioxide removal? Because I think it's not self-evident that we do, and I do find it personally very important to have a good reason why, why we are talking about it. And, and what exactly are we talking about, and why is now the time to time to talk about governance already? These questions I will, I will start with and turn to the CDR relevant governance in the European Union. Looking at EU climate policy, you mentioned already the long-term strategy. EU Green Deal is also important. In, we had it two days ago, ago, which is interesting in this regard, and also the climate, climate energy uh, frame 2030. And then finally look at, at three states and what, what is going on there. Um, and then, often, of course, conclusions. Just start with what uh, carbon dioxide removal is. Here, here's the definition by the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. Carbon dioxide removal is less anthropogenic activities removing CO2 from the atmosphere and durably storing it. Uh, in various forms. This is the very general definition. Uh, and what for? Well, what, why do we need it? And we need it first for so-called residual emission. So to reach net zero in 2050, we, we will have 2050, we will have some emissions, for example, example in transport or in agriculture that are very hard or not possible to um, uh, to, to mitigate. And therefore, we, we will have to have some, some, some odds there. 
So we have residual emissions. Mm -hmm. Then we have net neg negatives in the second second half of the three. We will have to have to that to, to stay under 1.5 degrees global warming. I talk about the, about this in a second, more detail. So why are we talking about, about carbon tax removal and removal? And this is of course more a political perspective. As I'm a political scientist, uh, there are people in the room who could tell us much more about how this this topic emerged, but. Ask, why are we talking politically about this issue? I mean, there is one thing, and that's uh, linked to the Paris Agreement. Because in Paris, you, see, you all remember the celebratory picture when uh, the states agreed, and it was, it was a great success there. And if we look at, look at the target, thing is interesting that we don't have a decarbonization target in the Paris Agreement, but, but we have this uh, uh, wording here in Article 4.1 achieve a, the balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources, removals by, by sinks, greenhouse gases in the second of the century. And this actually is a, is a where political errors refer to when they push for the need of carbon dioxide removal. And we, we will see that in a sec, uh, uh, later talk about the, mem the mem uh, about member sta states of the EU, that there are countries who really push and reminding people of this definition that we really have to have removals uh, in the future. So this, this is one thing. And then in 2018, we had, we had this special order in 1.5 degrees, and uh, there are knowledgeable people, people in the room who know a lot about this report, I think, uh, to, to show uh, um, why, uh, why this is also a reason that carbon set removal popped up as a political issue in the, in the media. Uh, um, because we have here like four, um, Illustrative pathways, the model pathways, they are called, and all of, all of them in the second, second half of a series end up below zero line. So we have we have this net negative emissions I was talking about. Talking about. To them, we will will have uh, uh, carbon dioxide removal uh, um, in the second, second half of the series at the latest. Latest. Stop here. Stop here. A lot of interest, interest stuff there, but a uh, little bit, little bit more detail on how the four illustrative pathways think about. Uh, carbon removal. We see here here the four pathways, and we see that they differ substantially in the way how far they go below the zero line. And um, we see also that all all path pathways go below the zero line. Three of them use bioenergy and CCS, CCS, which is one method of carbon carbon dioxide removal. Talking about this in a second, a little bit more detail. And all pathways that limit global warming change to 1.5. Um, a, a U carbon dioxide removal on the order of 100, 1,000 gigaton ton in the 21st century. So, so there is an issue there, there. we should talk about it. Uh, it's far in the future, but I think it's relevant, relevant to, to talk about it already now. now. And the uh, scientists are, are doing this. Uh, Mings and us observe fast growing research on negative emissions. On the left side, you see different colors as are the different assessment periods of the, of the SCC, and we see that the amount of research on negative emissions is uh, growing very fast. On the right side, it's um, the different disciplines. And I won't go, on, go into detail here, here, just to show you that the research is growing fa fast. And then we also have at the pol political level a new uh, discussion about, about carbon dioxide removal. Greater to me, of course, is greater is also greater in the moment when we refer to political stuff. Most models assume, however, that future generations will somehow be able to suck hundred billions of, of tons of two out of the air technologies that do exist in the scare required and they never will. We see that it's actually on the main stage of policy, international climate policy, this issue is best very critically addressed also, and, and uh, this is a new development that is also, also interesting to, to look at. Um, this is complicated, I, no, I don't go detail here, just to show you that there are different ways of thinking about carbon dioxide removal. This is from the Unit Emissions Gap Report. We have, have natural measures and we have technological measures and we have, we have combined measures. This is bioenergy and CCCS. This is the thing that is mostly uh, in the, mod the models when, uh, when we have scenarios on 1.5 or 2 degree. And the natu natural things are forestation, biochar, soy carbon sequestration, and ecological as, for example, direct air, air capture, accelerated weather, weather and stuff that. Um, mm -hmm. Just to show you that there are different way ways, it's not only technologies, but all of them are not really deployed at a large scale. That's one of the problems. 
and it's, and it's still under research how, how and to what degree we could use them uh, to reach net negative emissions. Um, and then the question, why are we talking about governance? And I will turn to the EU in a second. Um, the IPCC says effective governance is needed to limit trade-offs between impacts on land and in water and nutrition. Because if you use uh, bioenergy and CCS in large, large scale, for example, there are always uh, impacts on land and water. And so these trade-offs are all in the IPCC special report. And they observe that we, we will have to uh, govern this effectively uh, if we want the trade-offs. But, but there's also other argument and because CDR govern governance structures often considered to contain pitfalls for climate action. And then there's often the argument of moral hazard. hazard that if you, you talk about, about these imagined technologies or measures of carbon removal, which are not yet deployed at large scale, you deter, deter the attention away from mitigation and we'll think more about this opportunity. Well, well, at one day we can remove the carbon and uh, there's a huge, huge in the CDR governance literature going on talking about CDR already changes the political situation of um, how people think, people think it should use it and then have less um, um, uh, political capital, actual financial capital for mitigation because they think we can use it uh, and use CDR. So, so, but I think tracking the, the emergence of CDR are relevant governance struct, uh, structures important exact, exactly of that because because we have to understand who is starting to talk about this and in what, what way are they talking about this? Is it the, the fossil fuel industry that talks about, talks about are the climate laggards or are also more progressive countries that are start talk, talking about it to achieve net negative? So this is why I think it's important. And we see some interesting things in, in the EU uh, going, going on there. Oops, sorry. Um, there is the European Green Deal everybody is talking about. It's hard to talk, talk about the UK governance right now without mentioning it, but it's, it's also quite ambiguous. And it's a political initiative by two of the most senior political actors in the EU, Ursula von der Leyen, the Commission President, and its Vice President. So they invested a lot of polit political capital, but that still is not really clear what will come out of that. You have, you have a very nice, nice picture, stuff like that, but it's, it's still very ambiguous. But the day before yesterday, we had a leak of, of the EU climate law. Climate law. It's very uh, fresh, so to say, and there are interesting things because now for the first time really define what climate neutrality in the European Union would mean. Um, before it was, it was not really here. They were talking about carbon neutrality and no, no one knew what, is, uh, what does it, it mean. And now they mentioned actually natural and technological solutions to achieve the balance between emissions and things. They say that we, it's a greenhouse gases and not CO2, which, which is also interesting because greenhouse gas uh, net zero uh, 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 is more ambitious than only CO2. Then we say it's domestically, so it's about, about the emissions and the removals in the European Union, which means, for example, the order of negative emissions from Australia to the, to the European would be possible in this, this, uh, in this initiative. And then they also prominently manage removals or negative after 2050. And this is also, also new when it comes to the, the political deals because after 1.5 special report, we heard a lot about the necess necessity to reach net zero, but we didn't really really hear a lot of necessity of reaching net negative after. It wasn't really in, uh, in, in the mind of the policy maker, make at least that's my perception. And it's interesting now to see that this is changing somehow. Um, <clears throat> European Commission in 2018 provided its long-term strategy, strategy uh, how they would think uh, net zero would be possible for the European Union. This is the result of their, of their, uh, uh, their own modeling and the scenario for staying below 1.5 global warming, warming, which means net zero in 2050, looks, looks like th this is the emission trajectory for, for 1.5 net zero. Uh, um, Areas. And it's interesting to see here, uh, these are the residual emissions I was talking about. So the EU, the EU will not be able to mitigate this amount of emissions here and will have to have negative emissions uh, in this, this amount to reach net zero in 2050. A little bit more detailed, you can see it in sectoral emissions by 50. 
these are the two scenarios that model um, uh, at zero in 2050. And we see that we have a 1.55 tech scenario and a 1.5 life scenario. And the difference between them is that the assumptions about the technological or natural uh, car removal measures are differently. In this, this 1.5 tech scenario, there is much, much more carbon removal technology, technology than uh, in this scenario, scenario where more about enhancing the WF sink. But we also see that carbon removal, removal technologies will also be necessary, necessary uh, scenario. Um, um, it's interesting, and the, the European Commission had his, had his own in the long-term strategy towards negative emissions. They also, in view of the seven build blocks of the uh, strategy, they uh, were talking about the need of removing carbon. And this is interesting because it wasn't really a topic, an issue before uh, for, for policymakers in the European Union. So the European Commission is communicating quite proactively uh, on this. So, but all of this was not really, really part of the legal legislation, not really legally binding. So now I want to turn to, to what is actually part of, of the legislation. And, and here, if we look at, at the Climate Energy Framework, framework 23, which was adopted in, in 2018, there are various acts which are, are um, very, very in interesting, but, but their negative emissions are not really, not, not really addressed, um, not specifically addressed. We have this at one, one point achieved net negative emissions after, after achieving net zero. Um, that's uh, in the regulation of the, the governance of the energy union. But as you see, this is not as specific as uh, from, um, the, the definition actually from the league. So we see some progress in defining how, how net zero climate neutrality or whatever you want to use uh, is defined by actual legislation. Um, and just a few words, because there are interesting developments when it comes to CDR relevant uh, legislation. Um, these are three, three pillars of EU uh, legislation in the 30 framework. And the, the LULUCF uh, pillar is, uh, is new. In, in 2018, for the first time, the European, European government itself, land use, and then land use change. If you look how, how these pillars inter interact, there is actually one thing interesting when it comes, comes to CDR, which, which is, will argue somehow, CDR policy by other means because and now slides get the slide gets a bit, bit messy. Um, try to explain it very briefly. So, this little CFCF pillar, you have to achieve a no debit rule. It's called. So, the emissions have to be net zero, um, and if you have emissions, uh, you will have debit after a very difficult accounting scheme, you will have deb debits. If you have net removal in your Lulu CCF sector, you will get credits. Um, um, having credits, of course, better than having debits, especially because you can, you can use the, the credits in, in your pot sharing where, where sectors just like transport or uh, some emissions of agriculture are being accounted. This means in the end, and, on a conceptual level, you could you use your removals in the Lulu CF sector to offset emissions uh, that are being produced by fossil fuel fuels, for example, the transport sector. And this is very limited. The amount is very limited, but, but it is interesting on a conceptual level that they provide this flexibility, especially because countries are now trying to negotiate a bigger amount of this flexibility. So there are already political initiatives to extend this, extend this flexibility. And there we see that the idea of carbon removal, of offsetting and, and maybe weakening mitigation efforts can actually somehow be included in the climate policy through, through well, uh, the back door or at least not really call, call carbon dioxide removal. But I think it's important to, to observe what's going on uh, here. Um, and if we look at, look at the memes, I will do it, do it uh, quite quickly now. There, there is reporting which is as a, as a political scientist very interesting because they all had to report, report on dimensions in a very systematic way all member states and they prepared a lot of pde pages i didn't expect that that amount i went through them and was looking for what is relevant for cdr and i identified three case studies uh, which i will talk about very briefly now so germany the united kingdom and poland and of course i'm aware that where the united kingdom is not uh, member of the European Union, uh, but, 
I think it's still interesting to talk about the United Kingdom because first there will be in the future in one way or another, another like regulative cooperation between the UK and the European Union. Uh, uh, it's still important, important to track what's going on there, on there. And also it's the most interesting case when it comes to carbon dioxide removal. So uh, I should talk, talk about it in a second. Um, also, they, they have very different approaches to policy and all of them have, have different ways of dealing with CDR, which I show you now. Germany is, is known as a front runner in energy transition and climate, climate policy but doesn't reach its target, target, that's another story. Um, the, the National Energy Climate Plan I was talking about uh, had a strong, strong focus on innovation through renewables, which is not surprising. Like Germany is very focused on renewables, stuff like that. And with regard to uh, CCDR, it's only at one, at one point mentioned that closing the carbon, carbon cycle industrial processes could be interesting, but they really not talk about um, uh, carbon dioxide removal. And if you talk to policy makers and observe what's, what's going on in Germany, you perceive that they're very reluctant and, and they say things like, no, it doesn't, it, it diverts the, the focus away from mitigation. Also, there is a the very toxic CCS, oh, oh, it should be CCS, um, CCS debate in Germany 10 years ago. Uh, it was really a huge political, political debate, so no one really wanted to touch this. Um, but there has been a research program on engineering, and also after the special report on one point degree, uh, the BMBF, the research industry, announced now will be uh, funding for carbon removal in uh, some degree. So very reluctant. Uh, it was different to the United Kingdom, where we're already in 2018, in two years before this report and in all the debates about uh, negative emissions. Uh, a published policy recommendations with the need for CDR, CDR 100 million tons of CO2 each, each year, uh, uh, um, and per, per year, and also national energy and, and climate, and this uh, um, uh, I was talking about, have an own negative emissions way. So they, they really talk very direct about it and about having headroom room for sectors to decarbonize later, which is an interesting framing how you could think about uh, how political policy makers could, could integrate the idea, idea of carbon dioxide removal in their uh, policy uh, making. And then we also see funding for CCS and C uh, CDR research and, and also a deployment project. And, and the dates about policy framework already emerged. So quite a different uh, political discourse compared to Germany. Uh, also the government is somehow more active, even proactive in uh, about carbon dioxide removal as, as, as an opportunity in the future. future. And then we have, have Poland. We have all these deba debates about uh, the, sorry, the Green Deal. Uh, they try to delay, delay in the target. They try to diverse, diversify these for climate neutrality uh, uh, to, stay, uh, to emit emissions longer. They also try to get a lot of money from the transition fund. And, um, and maybe you know this guy on the right, on the, right the president for uh, for, for COP29 in Katowice, and he's now the first climate minister. In, 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 so there are some things changing in, in how we debate climate policy, but at, at the same time, we'll always find this in the interpretation of the Paris, Paris Agreement, which is interesting, uh, especially if we think about the definition I gave at the very beginning. The Paris Agreement does not lead to the elimination of fossil fuels but to, to, to a development of new low, low emission technologies and strengthening the potential for this to removable, for example, by forest rebound and people. So uh, in other countries, it's not only about Poland, and there are many countries arguing that we push the forest, for example, or other carbon sinks, uh, we, we have opportunity to, to reach net zero at some point. point is an initiative um, in Poland. It's called uh, um, Forest Carbon Farm Farming. The idea of farming carbon, I didn't know until I arrived here how huge this story in Australia is actually, actually carbon farming, also the wording of carbon farming. I think it's something, uh, how the people uh, frame it, how they talk about it, how they try to integrate it, integrate it in actual policy. An interesting case in Poland, they have now a voluntary scheme of having uh, a removable credits. It's more of a greenwashing for fossil fuel industry right now. Right now but it will be interesting whether uh, the poll will try to integrate it at EU level at uh, some point. So 
my first, first conclusion, and this is, as I said, work in progress, is I think uh, uh, lecturing how political actors are, are the carbon dioxide free removal code with these, these three terms. So there are political actors who try to use it as strategic offsetting to reach region at the high offsetting uh, fossil emissions. There are also prog progressive entrepreneurs at various political levels, but if you look, if you look at the level, it would be the UK. But also, so there is restraints, wait and see. We don't really want to talk about the issue because we have other things to do. And it will be interesting to, to observe how they negotiate, how they, how they build alliances, uh, who will be in which, which corner. And this is something that will be uh, important if we talk about how the zero targets can be achieved uh, in the, f the future. And that's why I'm sort of saying there are differences and way ways of acknowledging the need for CDR if you look at EU. Um, um, for actors, and um, um, there are there are relevant aspects in the use inner core of climate governance, and I showed you this flexibility. Important, important to track uh, uh, who's uh, trying to, to extend these flexibilities, and then in the, the end, we will have to have to talk about effective and credible CDR governance because people already do that. And we have to think about how it is possible to governs CDR without under undermining any mitigation efforts. And then there are, there are questions about whether we need an explicit re removal target or there are different types. Do we talk, talk about technological or natural measures? Um, and then also the will come up, up whether we hoard negative emissions. And, and this is a question that links back to Australia because, because Australia could be and um, could hoard negative emission emissions. And with this, I have to end it and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Felix. Very uh, interesting, interesting discussion. Have we got any uh, questions? For the, for the purposes of the recording, we, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, look, thanks, mate. Uh, very much, and much. And just the point about carbon, you, you added me to that mix as well, too. So, sorry, to, to what? You add methane in that mix as well, too. Well, well it, it could be a political question whether you add or not. Like, if you look at New Zealand, for example, they, as far as I know, they didn't uh, integrate methane in their carbon uh, net zero tar tar in their net zero targets. Sorry. So, in the, the end, uh, it's, it's about, yeah, it's a, it's a political, only political, of course, of course. You are also a lot of, of Cutting questions whether it's credible to, to integrate it or not, or not, expert on that. But I think it's also also political. Um, and, and yeah, you should watch how they, which gases and how they account for are really important. Thank you for a very, very interesting. Uh, in your review of different sort of national, national strategies, have you seen uh, any variation on the time? for net zero emissions, or is the uh, consensus settled around 2050 as the date? Um, they, for now, they can't really, really agree on the timeline on 2050 because a group of countries surrounding Poland are opposing it, and they argue, like, we can stay, maybe, maybe we reach 60, and other countries reach net, net, net negative, uh, sorry, sorry, net zero earlier. So then, then the differentiation of uh, ambitions would, would be quite common to your climate policy to have this initiation. And they try to argue that, argue that not really, it doesn't really look, looks, I, I personally don't think that this is going to happen. I think it will be 2050, like the end date, and then some countries are achieving, achieving it here. Um, but I think, yeah, tomorrow there is a European Council of like, like the um, national minimum minister discussing exactly that, so uh, not decided. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimate in Energy College. Do you know any, any discussion in the background on uh, how they intend to define greenhouse gas uh, emissions with, with what metric? Like, do they assume global warming potentials um, that are up updated in the future, or other metric trick discussion among the EU? people uh, proposing that, that. I, I, I know that so that sometimes question is, is comes up but if I feel, I feel the debate not there, there at, like I mean the definition of climate neutrality as I showed it in the league that's the best we have now 
and don't feel like at political level level they're really discussing this metric issue, which is hard to understand somehow. <laughs> so um, I I don't know. I think there was a discussion about this metric when also came came to New Zealand. I, but yeah, in in, in the EU, I haven't really heard a lot about this. Thanks, Felix. It was really interesting. Um, so, so you said one drivers for governance is uh, the moral hazard issue, which obviously is a big one. But are there any other sort of sort of issues that are coming up um, that drive the need for governance? So in Australia, discussions about, about permits and additionality, um, things like that, that that are coming up could potentially be the big bangers informing not the so much the policies, but the policy policy instruments. Yeah, I think. I think actually is, is very important and it will be more important because COP25 in Madrid, there was, I, I would say without meaning it to be too negative, sort of hype surrounding nature-based solutions. Uh, I didn't really, didn't really understand that because the, the question of permanence and the question of how, govern, how you, will, you will govern nature-based solutions, how you will account for them, are also very, very, also very difficult. Yeah. Like, so, I think uh, this will bas basically will come down to to, to account accounting structures, and I don't know if this this really is at a polit political level. Like like there will be struggles at the European level uh, to this account, but it, it definitely is something that is, that is very relevant when it comes to governing uh, um, calm removal. Yeah. So I'll ask a question, which is uh, my right as the the, uh, the host. This might be slightly outside of your area of expertise. But yeah, yeah, even uh, sort of the import of, of, of carbon, I suppose, and that there's growing talk in the EU of uh, using carbon tariffs it would affect Australia, which would feed it into our trade negotiations at them. Uh, where's, where's that discussion at uh, within the EU, and do you think it's it could be realistic uh, within the next decade? Yeah, I, th I think it also now climbed up somehow the political ender, uh, and, but this and it also is, is is not new. I think uh, most supports this it uh, a lot. I think Germans, Germany is also just re reluctant to border attack adjustments. Um, I, know, I don't. It's my impression, and I am not an expert on that. But I think it doesn't gonna happen soon. And like I don't know. Sorry, the second question. Um, if, if you were the EU and you had the clear um, <laughs> ambition <laughs> to drive some, some projects that yeah. in 20, 30 years would get you large amounts of uh, net, net negative of negative emissions in order, in order to achieve what what pilot projects what what actual motor and brick brick stuff or, or short climate solution solutions we try to pull off of yeah uh, good question like, uh, <laughs> um uh i think i think uh you really you really need to draw all of them because you can't really really uh Assess right or what are the trade-offs that were mentioned in the IPCC when it comes to land use or uh, other sustainability uh, SDGs? Like what are trade-offs with, with this stuff and SDGs? I think you can't really know all of that right now. Now, so you need to need to explore the portfolio. And, and I mean, in Union now it talks it's about bioenergy and CCS in their long-term strategy and mention a direct air capture. Uh, and CCS, and then also, also like enhancing the LULUCF sink. But I think uh, it, it, it's maybe like, like personally, I would say it's not enough to, to stay with LULUCF because if we look at political discussions in, in Brazil now, so permanent, permanence is not only an environmental issue, but also a political issue. So, uh, safeguarding the permanence, yes. Um, Somehow we have to explore, explore stuff as well. Um, thanks, that's been really interesting. I so I have a question that sort of 
Paul draws on from Anita's question around government and around permanence and intentionality. And it, it gets very complex and very quick, very quickly into the accounting um, metrics and that debate when you talk about permanence. But at a, at a broader level, um, part of the reason um, people are so, are so concerned about per permanence, all of it with regard, regards to Ensign Lulu CF for is that they assume that the Lulu CF will, will offset any CDR, will offset fossil fuel, fuel emissions. And, and so I think this is, is actually core governance question. To what degree do we expect CDR, CDR to offset fossil fuel emissions? Yeah. Because if it's not, it's not doing that, permanence question is much different on a much different, different time scale. Um, and so your sort of Venn diagram thing, um, which, I, which I can't remember now, but the, the different positions people are coming from, um, do you have a sense of, of how much that is part of the um, commendation? Is, are, we, are, we, are we going to be, it, it almost feels like from the way you presented it, that in Europe, the basic assumption is CDR is to set fossil fuel emissions, whether they're just the residual ones, which would be very mm -hmm. limited, or overall, and how much is that a part of the conversation? Can when we, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's a good, it's a good, very, very good to, to remind of that setting Fossil emissions uh, uh, changes also the way how you govern, govern removal. So these are two different issues. And um, I think when you talk about the strategic off offsetting, uh, those countries or political actors, not only not countries, they really think think about achieving net zero and offsetting stuff like that. And then the stuff to offset gets politicized somehow. So, so uh, everybody everybody wants to set, of course. Uh, and uh, reduce less emissions. So uh, this really is um, something that, that would be true for the strategic offsetting. But I think um, the progressive policy entrepreneurs, if you want, if you want to go like that, that um, there are also more more in political actors aware of the necessity of net negative emissions and try to try to explore that this could be maybe niche market markets and the UK. Some, sometimes you get pressure that actors are really identifying themselves as being the entrepreneurs there who can provide solution for, for this and like also make money with it and then i think the governance question is, is is different and i think i'm trying to get my head around whether um, um removal to target would be the right way of governing it because if you separate removal tar targets from mitigation targets targets you would have a clear distinction between what is what has to be mitigated and what has to be removed, and then countries couldn't or, or other politicians couldn't really change the amount of what is mitigation and, and what is a, a removal. So this might might be a good way, but I also don't see the European European Union deciding on a, on a removal target. But I think discussions about that would be would, would be very to address the challenge I mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I kind of. I have a, I had another, another question I was asked, but it follows up so much on that I have, have to know. Um, and it's related to another slide about your Lulu, Lulu stuff and the flexibility with the um, other thing. Um, and so there's, there's an issue here, the flexibility with effort sharing. There's an issue here where there's a lot of complaints from the forestry industry and others related to forests in Europe that the um, limit on the flexibility um, juices the incentive to enhance Lulu CF removals because you can't, you don't get credits, you can't get credits past a certain extent. And, and the Commission's um, um, aim when we were first coming up with this Lulu CF pillar was for uh, uh, zero forest sector, net zero Lulu, zero Lulu sector. When the, the when you talk about the net negative emissions debate, we want want we don't want net zero, net zero Lulu, we want net neg negative emissions. Yeah. And it seems very obvious to me that, that the solution to that would be would be to remove stability and then yeah. you can remove the cap. And yeah. I have suggested this at several conferences in Europe and people are like, no, 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 no. Because the, the flexibility is so, so um, politically, it's so yeah. politi politically important, that flexibility. But I think that is exactly the issue here in terms of enhancing sinks and the accounting issues at Brim. Mm -hmm. And what do you, do you think about, like, you could also decide this no, no debit rule, but this would be a, be a way to have Net zero, uh, um, like net negative, if 
uh, bar you have to achieve. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like the remove okay. target could be in, be integrated uh, if you have to achieve not that, but you have to achieve evil in your list yet. So. Yeah, I, I mean, that, I guess it's it, that shows lots of options to discuss other than just removing the, removing the flexibility. There'd be yeah. issues, issues there where that penalizes people who didn't achieve mm -hmm. um, removal as opposed to no debit. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a really interesting area of debate or for, for CDR elements. The questions keep on coming. Um, <laughs> this one, carbon pricing, and what your view is on carbon pricing <laughs> as a mechanism uh, to address climate change problem, uh, and particularly because um, carbon markets operate uh, on the basis of flexibility and exchange. Firstly, by, by uh, often grouping together uh, different enhanced gases into a carbon dioxide equivalent, and then sort of translating that, in that into a form of commodity that could be traded and shared. Uh, and so in the, so in the context of, of the discussion here, um, what do you want carbon price pricing? <laughs> Another very big question. Uh, um, I think, yeah, yeah. Well, let's answer that from the CDR perspective. I think it's pretty hard to have any CDR. If you think about needing like, large, like having large scale CDR, you will, you will have to have somehow carbon price, I'd say. And all, and all models uh, assume that. So it wouldn't, I, I don't know. I, maybe these re regulatory flexibility can like uh, be in a way, but no, not not large scale. You, you would have to have, yeah. yeah. I think I go with that. <laughs> Another question then. then. Go to your uh, slides with your diagrams, Felix. So, so in my 2018 paper, I argued that globally we're seeing this wait and, wait and see space that governments are just waiting to see who's going to act first and then act will li likely some group of actors will eventually set the direction that go in this do you get the sense that the EU is stepping up to that leader in that in this space that they're the most advanced in this discussion, mm -hmm. or do there are other communities, particularly like epistemic communities or, or um, uh, industry sort of so yes, startups that might be taking charge more that entrepreneurship area? Yeah, um, yeah, very very good question because I, I think it would be a role role for the European Commission to to be this this progress progress leader somehow uh, in this area and it has been leader in sort of sort of unconditional climate policy issues like ETS were, were in, in, in Europe, Europe pushed this a lot as like like this leader and, and it could be a possibility that the European European Commission pushes proactively in this and uh, the long-term strategy has some aspects like in it uh, where, you, where you think of like this chapter on towards negative emission and it really is the way forward and we are showing you it works and stuff like But it also at the same time, um, it's only the European Commission and like, like if all member states have to agree on that stuff and if I think about Germany, for example, they wouldn't really, I mean, agree on, on a removal target as far as I see, it wouldn't really be very li likely for German poli uh, policymakers. So, and the EU as a whole, as a whole does, uh, is also a lot, lot more complicated. So, uh, and then, then yeah, of course, startups, they are, they are to create these this, this niche. We have uh, in Switzerland going on. Also, uh, there, there are in the UK and US, Canada also. Um, and yeah, but also it's like they are, most of them are trying to do uh, direct capture and sense CCS, uh, but it's also like storing the carbon in the CCS part is also very difficult in, in, in Europe uh, to regulate it. So I think, yeah, I don't know. They will try to push it, but I don't know how successful they will be in the European Union. Would you be able to go back to the, back slide. To the slide where you had the, the leak document? Yes. And from the four LM elements that you outlined there, um, what do you think is most under the attack? What will survive the final version of the attack? Um, so they built in another area for attack, which is not in here, but they 
said that uh, we will have, have the capacity to, to have so-called delegated acts on climate targets will definitely be uh, uh, kicked out at some point. So there is some other area for, for contestation in, in this document. When it comes to this, to this I really don't, I, I didn't see this through natural and technological solutions for uh, there because this, this could really be a link to, um, to uh, CDR technologies and like, like uh, I don't know, I don't really see it staying there also because it's new. Um, I think this greenhouse gas in definition will still stay there. Like, like it, they won't decide now CO2 uh, uh, neutrality target. I, I mean, it's a story of ambition if you, if you know what to reduce it. So that's not very like, likely. And this domestic, domestically, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It might, might change, change in, in the process, but in the long run, I could see the European Union under the pressure to open their decision on not relying on an internal uh, credits, so to say, because it's just very hard. And there are countries like Australia who could provide a lot of offsets, for example. So it might change in the future, but also not in this process, I mean. Uh, thanks, Felix. Uh, Graham Burns, Burns, my name. I'm joining of uh, technical systems. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, Australia has a very heavily federal process uh, when it comes to, to decision making with regards to large, large technical systems. And, and uh, that sort of enforces a much, much more participatory approach or co evolving with the design of a sustainable economy. Uh, there's a more democratic quality, you might say, that's enforced, forced by the federated system. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering the EU, because of its uh, diverse sort of uh, union also is taking advantage of the possibilities for participatory a more democratic approach uh, uh, because uh, differentiated uh, polities. Well, um, yes and no, because they, they have to involve a lot of uh, actors there. And so, so what we saw from the European Commission, that will never be uh, uh, the position of the European Union and they always have to like countries are always obliged to do stakeholder en engagement, so they really, really try to 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 talk to a lot of people. People, but at, at the at the same time, also uh, you you have the struggles between the country, for example, where Poland Poland now is trying to delay uh, the net the net zero. Uh, uh, you have actual, actual power play uh, between the states and like more and more countries really try to single out Poland and, and to bring alliance. So it's really like polit politic going on there. And that's not the, the positive story of, of uh, engaging everybody and having like a, like a smooth consensus actually quite competitive uh, somehow agreeing on this target. So, um, yeah. Are there any further questions? Like we don't, don't, so we might wrap it up there. It's a fascinating time to be uh, looking at EU climate politics. Politics are crucial. Five months, you've got, you've got a new commission, a new parliament. They're negotiating the next the next seven year bid. So, what happens yeah. next? And and they're dealing with a Brexit as well. So, what what happens next? Uh, uh, Twelve months uh, will be very, will be very important for what happens in the next years. I I think so. Uh, an interesting perspective. A big round of kind of applause for Felix. And just a reminder, a reminder uh, about next week's week seminar, we have two senior executives uh, coming to talk about regulation of industrial demand response. So one for the uh, energy, energy nerds, with senior, senior executives, one from uh, EMO and one from the AEMCMC. So a very, very interesting uh, seminar. Keep an eye on our website and our Twitter feed uh, as we've got a weekly seminar series about until May at least. So, so thank you. We can see you next time.